Welcome back. You're watching Indian Open right here on Bloomberg Quint Live. Uh, looks like another uh, sore start for the markets, at least the rest of Asia is uh, looking weak. Though uh, Hang Seng has picked up from the lows of the day. Yeah, but uh, well, if you we were if you we were not able to blame yesterday's falls on global markets, today there is one reason for the markets to come off, and that's the glo local uh, the global markets. But uh, Let's see. Uh, the mood certainly seems to have turned pensive yesterday in the dealing rooms, Devina. Yeah, and and you know even in terms of the the money that's been coming in, uh, we've been seeing on days like this while the FIA has been pulling out. It, it's not so much so of a support any which ways from the DII yeah, desk. So, uh, four straight days of a pullout uh, yeah. from the FIs. Um, Maybe, although maybe shortly, but you don't know. <laughs> for now, there seems to be nervousness for sure. Yeah, the quantum is also less than the way they've been putting in money. So yeah. probably at some point you would have seen some profit taking. But nonetheless, um, um, Asia's pocket looks weak. SGX is looking to have a weaker start. About half a percent given up by the SGX Nifty right now. Uh, 52 points under. That's 11,486. Yesterday, we breached uh, uh, you know the marker of 11,500 as well briefly came back up a bit. But let's uh, take a look at now what's been happening in the derivative space as well as give you a better indicator of the more liquid space. Uh, Agam Wakil joins in with more details on that, Agam. Thanks for that, Devian, and good morning to you as well. Uh, well, uh, we did see weakness yesterday. We were expecting that weakness to come through on account of global uh, queues. And uh, we, we saw further increase in open interest of as much as 5 4.5% in the Nifty. And selling was evident in the Bank Nifty futures too, uh, as we saw a nearly 12% increase in open interest there as well. The India Volatility Index did not advance as much, but it is still at heady levels of around 26.5, and this is the highest that we've seen since 2015. So uh, it's at a four-year high at this point. But uh, when it comes to your change in open interest, it is the 11,800 put, uh, which is looking at substantial writing, and this may. Uh, make uh, one curious as to why it's a put and not a call, considering we saw so much weakness and uh, you know the indices are well below that mark. As far as interest, open interest distribution is concerned, again, we continue to keep an eye on the 12,000 call. And on the lower end, if for now, we do have substantial open interest accumulation around the 11,500 put, even though the Nifty, or rather the SGX Nifty for now, is below that mark. But uh, let's move in and talk about stocks. So before that, though, put call, the put call ratio is now at a neutral level of around 1.1, a relatively neutral level. And of course, in terms of stocks, while Jet Airways remains in the FNO band, among others, we're keeping an eye on several other stocks which are buzzing. CG Power will be in focus, uh, considering uh, well, uh, Sunil Mittal has picked up stake in the company. Marico, of course, uh, big, big longs coming through. Godrej Industries on the losing end and in terms of stocks which are unwinding. Again, we're seeing a lot of traction in Hexaware, Ajanta Pharma, and Jet Airways looking at some amount of unwinding too. So we keep an eye on these stocks. But well, all, all said and done, as per indications of the SGX Nifty, perhaps uh, soft opening today. Okay, let's wait and watch. Soft opening for sure. Uh, maybe the SGX Nifty is also belying what the actual opening could be like because if you, uh, I, I take on, uh, thanks so much for that. I take on board your point, Devina, that. Uh, um, you know, Shanghai, for example, is picked up from the lows of the day. But uh, one, uh, the ferocity with which Dow fell yesterday mm -hmm. and, and the broad-based nature of the sell-off. Mm -hmm. And two, uh, the Chinese trade data, which will come out later today, might also not paint a very pretty picture. But compared to estimates, you don't even know what happens. But uh, if the Chinese trade data is not too positive, yeah. and if the trade talks are not going as per plan, which have the potential to shave off about a percent of Chinese GDP numbers, then the market should not take this well. Yeah, but you know, in, in the past also we've seen this and, and on occasions where the, the global markets have really sold off. Uh, when our market has previously itself covered that move, the next mm. day has not been all that bad. All that bad. So it's it's done its own thing in a way, but um, you know, times are different. We're in slightly more volatile times considering the election uh, jitteriness that's coming about as well. We've got just about two weeks left to go to find out who's going to take helm. Uh, and uh, all of those factors kept in mind with the India VIX itself, which had not been at these levels uh, during that time, which suggesting that there are more hedges in place. And Hemain pointed out that the open interest positions are very light. Mm. So no one's going very heavy in terms of positions as well. Yeah. Well, let's wait and watch what happens during the course of the next few days. But it's interesting times for sure um, as to what happens uh, over the um, next few sessions as market participants grapple with not just the low, uh, global uncertainty which is high 
but the local uncertainty as well. Arguably, the most important next two weeks of trade in the last five years that we have for the next two weeks. Uh, let's wait and watch what happens there. However, uh, before we move any further and get in our guests on board, it's important to highlight all the key newsmakers in the session today, some key numbers that came out, and then um, what else um, in terms of news so will keep the markets excited. So let's go across to our research team to try and figure precisely that. Darshan and Ragam join in to talk about that. Uh, gentlemen, both of you, good morning yet again. Dashan, let's start off with the key stocks and news first. Yeah, so a couple of results uh, before stocks and news. First of all, C8 numbers disappointed. Revenues, even though they were up 5%. Profit was down 17%. EBITDA was down 18%. Uh, Q4, no, no doubt, saw, saw a sharp cut in employee and overhead cost. But uh, uh, raw material cost played the spoiler. So if you're looking at the percentage of sales, uh, raw material cost incre increased from 56% to 58%. And interest cost has also been starting to inch up as they go ahead with CAPEX. So C8 was a bad number. ABB India was in line with S Estimates, revenues up 18%, profit up 13%, EBITDA up 63%, the finance cost was down 87%, but they came in line with the Bloomberg consensus estimates. Among the other numbers, SL Propag, Brigade, Mahindra Logistics came out with strong set of numbers. Gujarat Borosil was in line while BSE was weak, but remember, BSE also announced a share buyback, so probably that could provide some bit of support. Other share stocks to watch out for, uh, CG Power yesterday, Yes Bank acquired 8 crore shares or close to 12.8% stake in the company by invoking the pledge of the promoters. Uh, Sunil Bharti Metals holding company also acquired another 65 lakh shares in the company. Uh, Olympic Pharma enters into a joint venture contract uh, with the SPH Group uh, to sell products in the Chinese market. Remember, we've seen of late a lot of Indian companies are trying to breach the Chinese barrier. Uh, Biocon retails economic interest in commercialization of Julio. Uh, they will get a share of profits from the global markets. Uh, SL Group has said that uh, Z Entertainment stake sale is at an advanced stage. They have come out with a press release on the same, and they want housing finance gets the NHB nod to sell the entire 9.15% stake it has in Aadhaar housing finance to Blackstone. Okay, well, that's a bunch of stocks to monitor and a bunch of results as well. We'll talk about all of those with our guests. Gurmeet should be joining us any moment. But uh, before that, Agam, I think a stock that everybody will keep an eye out for is Titan. My question yeah. though is, while it's been volatile as a stock, uh, any volatility expected in earnings? Uh, no, not necessarily, uh, Neeraj, and uh, you know, this is something that the, uh, the companies already told us about in the, in the mid-quarter update. So we're expecting very steady earnings coming through, about 19% growth seen at the top line, expansion of as much as 40 basis points in EBITDA margins, and we could actually see profits rise over 40% to around 401 crores. Now, you know, the, the management has already suggested that they're going to see 20% growth for the entire year as far as the jewelry segment is concerned about well over 80% of your revenues come from there. And uh, this time around, uh, analysts are anticipating 24 to 25% percent growth on a year-on-year -year basis for the quarter. Uh, we see 17% growth for the watches segment, which has picked up quite substantially over the previous three quarters, as is the case for eyewear as well. So that volatility has reduced quite substantially, and eyewear could likely see 19% growth coming through. There could be some amount of... Um, with pressure as far as gross margins are concerned, but on the whole, we're expecting a very steady quarter from Titan Company. Mm, interesting. Watch out for that too. Thanks a lot, both of you, for bringing us those updates. Gurmeet Chadda uh, Johnson right now with his thoughts on well, specific pockets, maybe the market mood at large. Uh, Gurmeet, good having you. Thanks much for joining in. Um, are you in a bit of a risk-off mode right now, irrespective of how good an opportunity might be looking for the next two weeks? Uh, there is on the on the on the uh, broader markets uh, not not really on a risk off but uh, a little more caution considering uh, uh, the developments uh, uh, in last few days uh, i think selectively there are opportunities and i've been you know we have been having this discussion that you know staying on cash doesn't hurt in india too much because that also gives you a decent yield of 7 8% uh, so there there are pockets where you know i think the uh, the opportunities will come and you have to see where where there is uh, uh, most of the negatives are priced in or or uh, you know likely to be priced in over next maybe uh, maybe a quarter or so and those are the pockets one can one can keep looking at you know um, you know you know we have seen that uh, you know over a 3 to 5 year basis if you miss your 10 20 best days you know your your returns really suffer so uh, there's no point staying out completely, but uh, avoiding momentum plays, avoiding uh, uh, you know being uh, uh, buying on the first EBGA dip, uh, thinking that it's very cheap. Uh, so just just 
you know look at the basics and 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 go about it i think if you see banks uh, uh, you know for example despite the results icic had i think uh, what profit it is showing now and what profit it will show 12 months down the line that could be a 3x 4x jump uh, uh, similarly uh, in the case of uh, you know some of the telecom names we are seeing some improvement in arpu from airtel i have been one of the contrarian uh, you know i have a contrarian view on telecom and we have been discussing that so i think there are pockets uh, so there are mixed mixed trends while consumption shows a slow down bank credit growth shows an uptick the industrial uh, activity shows an uptick so it's a, it's a bit of a mixed signals right now so keep buying uh, quality stuff on dip quality stuff on dip yesterday session uh, through the spotlight back on z and not just because of the move yesterday yesterday in fact it wasn't bad because it fell about 10 odd percent but then recovered towards the end of the trading session closed just about 4.8 percent under which would have been any normal day uh, but the last few days have been particularly wobbly for the counter uh, the management putting out uh, a formal note saying that they're very close uh, to getting a deal done but the market is a bit worried about the price the valuations at which the deal could happen gurmeet what's your sense about z and how that stock is likely to do or rather if an investment at all ahead of this particular deal is is warranted uh you know uh, tempted to uh, they will look at it and maybe accumulate something uh, you know I, i spoke to a lot of fund managers post market hours yesterday figuring out if there's been any uh, you know invoking of pledge and there's some selling which has happened uh, my understanding uh, uh, while the information is not very full proof on this is that it was not the institutional lenders which which sold some of the individual uh, lenders did sell some shares uh and also i mean while the information is not really correct and i don't want to you know speculate on this is that uh, mr chandra is in us and uh, they are very close to uh, uh, sign a non binding agreement but till the time it happens uh, you know uh, and that's the reason probably would have seen some recovery happening uh, uh, in the last half an hour uh, of trade so you know as i said the asset itself has value uh, you know uh, you know for somebody to come in india set up a channel and a network like that uh, will require a lot of time and cost outlay i think it's a good asset i think the only only thing we have to watch out is the there should not be further delay uh, in monetization of this asset and that that could be a, a, a you know so below below 375 to me it looks looks attractive uh, purely uh, because that if you see their financial pure operating performance in subscription revenue advertisement revenue their ott platform i think last quarter was good for them with some of the new series which they did uh, i think purely on operating numbers it looks good i just hope the fingers crossed that the deal happens also for the larger market at stake because uh, you know sl adag uh, dhfl uh, yes bank downgrades uh, the last thing you want is something to blow up now because eventually remember the big, the crises are always triggered by the by the credit events and not as much by the equity events Hmm. we saw that happen to the others as well we saw dish tv and the way it moved z learn also uh, took a knock in yesterday's session so the entire group is such uh, so a little bit of a crumble yeah I, i think the other uh, fear in the market is that if the deal is happening at a much lower price devina then what happens to the entire set of payables that the z group the promoters owe to all creditors and if it if it doesn't happen at a premium then do they have to sell a larger stake, stake to whoever yeah. they sell to and not just the 20% and and that is something that would uh, be an interesting monetable too but yeah, like you said because you know it's market. interesting uh, when it last fell to, and made a low of about 288 post which it closed at 318 uh, it moved up to about 425 but you know if conversations were ongoing at that time there must have definitely been something around uh, you know the stock price coming off and therefore why pay such a premium uh, for the stock which has already come off the way it has though it did manage to go up about 400 but now back at about 370 yeah maybe the buyer no i mean don't quite know how the deal would be happening but yeah it, it's an interesting monetable z uh, keep in mind the promoter or the sl group has said that the stake sale could be near uh, fructification very very shortly uh, something that we spoke about earlier in the day uh, gurmeet was the what the results of brigade enterprises uh, the margins came off but top line healthy growth due to some other uh, adjustments the bottom line grew about 3x but leave that leave the anomalies out just a 75% growth in top line for a real estate company in quarter 4 means that they are doing something right is 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 this a 
real estate stock that you would look at if you are looking at the real estate space in the first place? So Neeraj, I, I will look at real estate. Uh, you know, I think it's, it's you know, we had demonetization, uh, then you had RERA related disruption, and then you had something on the GST. So I think it's, it's, it's been a lot of turmoil uh, for real estate. And I think that's, that's clearly reflecting in the prices some of them have. I think I've been, I've been speaking to a lot of uh, developers. Some of them happen to be clients, not necessarily in the listed space. Is that there is that consolidation, uh, uh, you know, which is happening amongst the top three, four players in, in each geography. Uh, also, you know, I was going through a night Frank report. There some interesting findings coming, coming up there. I think, I think what is a clear trend is that residential sales for lower size units, which are mid, which are in the mid range, is something where we are seeing some demand uh, come in. And there is some price reduction happening. It's not officially done, Neeraj, in terms of announcing, uh, you know, over media. That, but if you are sitting across the table uh, uh, with developers who have projects ready, I think there is significant price negotiation you do, and you get a good value for the deal. And I think we are seeing that, uh, whether it is Godrej properties, we saw them pip some of the other developers in residential sales. In, in, in Gurgaon and, and uh, in NCR as well, we are seeing that, you know, the, the likes of ATS and others doing better. Similarly, in South, we had uh, some good numbers from Prestige. We had Soba, which is all, you know, obviously doing well. What impressed me about Brigade was also that, that their leasing, hospitality and commercial business was also uh, 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 doing well. So I'm seeing selectively where, uh, you know, if you see the debt levels coming down, uh, you see some monetization of your rental uh, assets, which was the case with DLF, some intent by the promoter to infuse more capital. I think this could be a very, very interesting space uh, because whenever there is consolidation after so much pain, uh, the stronger ones uh, do emerge out. So I'll be positive on it uh, geography-wise, maybe DLF in North and uh, Godrej Properties as a, more as a, as a, as a pan-India play and down south, uh, uh, Prestige and Soba. Okay, got well, that. Um, Godrej properties though, which, I mean just look at Godrej properties actually, after going to about uh, 960 or the stock's back down to about 774, so that big leap that it took is probably given all of that, almost all of that back uh, itself, so uh, probably for traders booking out obviously was a very crucial aspect uh, instead of losing so much from the top. Uh, Talking about uh, trading and talking about what positions we can take, let's bring in our technical experts. Gaurav Bissa of LKP Securities is joining us on the show. Chandan Tapare of Moti Dalosval Securities is also there with us. Gentlemen, good morning to the both of you. Um, let's talk about the Nifty. What's the trade that you envisage that could be slightly more risk-reward favorable, uh, considering that we are at such levels right now? I'll start off with you, Chandan. A very good morning. Uh, yesterday, uh, market has broken its major support of 11,550 after the consolidation of last 24-25 trading session. Every time it was respecting the same and was finding buying interest, but yesterday it has broken. That's why the trend is going to turn on the immediate basis. The weekly RSI has also turned on the lower level and given a negative crossover, so which indicates that some sort of profit booking or decline could be there in the market. And after breaking the immediate support of 11,550, the index has potential to retest the next support of 11,420 and 11,333 kind of level. We also seen the selling pressure in many heavyweights counter. So jump in the volatility with some more decline in the market could be seen. And our suggestion is now continue to be on slightly negative note till it remains below 11,550 or 11,666 kind of level. So that is why we are now turning our view on the slightly negative side and suggesting to be with 11,500 put. By this put on lower levels if it uh, drifts uh, from the uh, after its opening level and put the stop loss of 30 and raise for the target to 100 level in this. Similarly in the bank nifty index uh, it has also broken the support of 2950 uh, 500 zone and now till it remains below the same it is downside open target to us 29,000 to 28,888 kind of levels. And then just wondering uh, would uh, won't the IVs be substantially higher right now for these put options. So even if the markets were to decline post the election verdict or otherwise, uh, won't the gains be capped because the IVs also will collapse and therefore the pricing will not change materially? Or are you playing this for the next few days before the election verdict comes out? See, for option buying side, we'll only trade before the election outcome. Because what we believe the IV is near to 26.5. Uh, two days back, IV went to 27.84 and this is the highest level in last 38 months. We are expecting overall IV to head to us 32-34 kind of level and post the election outcome, 
the IV will collapse to 15, 16 levels and that is the nature of the option market once the uncertainty gets over. So suggestion is just to get the movement on immediate basis and don't take these trades uh, on day of election outcome. A new or fresh, tradition, uh, fresh position can be taken on those days. And uh, those who are looking to even take the position better to go with the spread because the IV will matter a lot rather than any other factor in the market in the recent scenario. So this strategy or this 11,500 put is on the weekly basis to trade the immediate uh, price momentum. And those who are looking for some downside or hedging activity can shift in the bear put spread rather than taking the naked uh, option activity in the market. Okay. Gaurav Bisa, uh, what is your trading strategy right now? Are you negative as well and are you using options or are you using plain vanilla futures to trade that? Good morning. Uh, in, for today, it depends uh, where exactly are we opening. Uh, if you look at the HGX and if you see 60-70 point gap down, I don't think uh, it would be futile if somebody stays short uh, for an extended period of time. We may see a technical bounce sort of. But if you open flat, then yes, even I would uh, agree with uh, buying a put option or probably a, a bear put spread can be uh, deployed for that matter because 11,550 was the immediate uh, support. We are trading below those levels. So as long as we are trading below 11,550, uh, it would be a sell and rise market for me uh, for time being. On the other hand, if we see a continuous fall and if we hover around levels of 11,400, for me that would be a very lucrative uh, buying uh, uh, point for the reason uh, predominantly on the technical side, there will be a bullish uh, harmonic pattern being formed at those levels uh, and we can have a 30, 40, 50 point stop loss and uh, on the upside one can even expect 200 point up move. So for me, uh, my levels are very clear. If we open gap down, I would wait for for the dip towards 11,400 and then buy plain vanilla futures. As we mentioned in the beginning of the show that the IVs are too high and buying a, a, a call or put option might not be the best strategy in such times. And if we see Nifty opening flat or small amount of upside is seen today, then I would be a seller in Nifty. Okay. That is a call coming in from Gaurav Vissa on the index. Let's get in some stock specific ideas as well from both uh, Gaurav and Chandan. But before that, uh, let's move on to our special segment, Bloomberg Edge, where Yash Padhyay tells us about a pattern that the Bloomberg terminal has thrown up on a particular stock. Yash, what's the stock on your radar today? Morning, Devina. So we are tracking PNB housing finance on the charts and a buy signal is coming in on the counter on the back of the stochastics indicator. Uh, as we do always, let's just try and understand what the stochastics indicator is. Uh, it basically is a trend following momentum oscillator and it helps you identify when a price move is overextended uh, by measuring uh, the recent highs to its, uh, you know, relative highs to its highest highs as well as its lowest lows. And now in the case of, uh, you know, PNB housing finance, what we've seen over here uh, is that the stock has has made a double bottom formation now. Uh, what I mean from a double top, double bottom is the fact that the stock had, man, had you know you know reached the bottom uh, of its price move back in the month of October last year at about 700. Uh, it has been in a strict range st trading between 700 to 1000 for the last uh, six to eight months, uh, with 700 being a strong support zone for the counter. Uh, it has off recently come under significant pressure and after uh, you know giving up from the levels of thousand where the risk to reward rate was also unfavorable it has now made a base at about 700 and has started to move ahead as well the stochastics indicator which is there in the bottom panel as well has given a positive crossover uh, which indicates a potential buy uh, signal from here on and that the strength has moved in the counter from here on uh, what we've also done is take a look at the weekly charts and here too as we could see uh, the mark of 700 that has been a big support zone for the counter and has been uh, you know the double bottom formation that I was talking about the RSI 2 has given a positive divergence uh, what I mean by that and if we could enlarge the lower panel is the fact that at the mark of 700 we've seen that the RSI 2 has you know uh, managed to move up before you know going below the mark of 30 which would have made it uh, cross the oversold mark and we could see that the trend line 2 is uh, you know moving higher uh, which indicates that on both the parameters this stochastics as well as the RSI, uh, the strength seems to be that from 700, the stock could bounce uh, further ahead. Right. Uh, and how well has this worked in the past, Yash? Uh, so, Devina, the, the stochastics indicators in fact worked very well because five out of the last nine times uh, that, the, uh, that, that it has, uh, you know, come to these levels, uh, it has managed to gain anywhere close to four and a half to five percent over the next one month. Okay, got that. Thanks a lot for that, Yash. So that's what you've got uh, in terms of the Bloomberg Edge. Let's uh, get across some stock ideas from our technical experts as well. Chandan, why don't we start off with you? Yeah, uh, so here uh, selecting two trades, buy and sell side both. 
Uh, for buy side, uh, we have selected to be with uh, Larson and Tubro. Uh, because on last trading session, even after the market fall, the stock was consolidating in a range. However, because of the gap down opening, stock may slightly open lower. But comparatively, from last uh, five, six weeks, the stock is getting some stability, holding near to 50 exponential moving average. On weekly scale, the stock is forming pole and flag pattern. A small follow up can lead it to higher zone. So, looking at the outperformance nature of this stock, we are recommending to go long on any decline with a stop loss of 1344 and expecting it to move towards 1410 kind of level. One negative trade that is sell on the Asian pin. This stock has given a breakdown from its uh, rising channel on the weekly and the daily scale. It has started to form lower highs, lower lows, and given a breakdown from a consolidation bend uh, below its major support of 1420 zone. So, recommending to sell with a stop loss near to 1414, and this stock can drip towards 1345, 1340 zone on the lower side. Okay. Gaurav Bissa, what about you? The first uh, recommendation today would be a sell call on uh, Innocent Bank. We have seen consistent short positions getting built. It's been uh, reaching crucial uh, support area. And uh, the kind of uh, move that we've seen in Bank is a chance that uh, the selling may aggravate in coming days. So on that premise, one can uh, sell it, keep a small sum of 1545. On the downside, uh, the target would be around 1490 to 1485. Second recommendation would be a small, uh, small uh, uh, conditional buy on Mahindra and Mahindra. We have seen a lot of the stocks correcting. Mahindra has also seen a strong correction. However, in the last three, four days, we have not seen the intensity in this selling side, and that is a positive sign. Small amount of uh, uh, short turning was seen yesterday. If the level of 635 are sustained, we can expect a bounce towards level of uh, 665, 670. One can buy it, which is about 640. Keep a stop of uh, 672 on the downside. Uh, on the upside, uh, one can expect 665 kind of level. Okay, so those are some trading calls that you need to monitor today. We haven't quite discussed Vedanta Gurmeet. What did you make of the results? Brokerages have given uh, you know, mixed views out here on what the zinc business could do post FY20 as well. That's too far away. Yep. The near term might be bogged down by what's happening in China alone. Absolutely, Neeraj. Uh, so while, while, the, while the management also has tried hard to you know, the even LA affairs on the the Anglo-American investment, they did, uh, you know, uh, clarifying on the uh, the embedded put option and minimum return on those investments. Also, there have been news for the copper smelter plant shut down, uh, you know, for that. Uh, I think what, what was decent was that the uh, the zinc business as well as the oil, which which almost makes up 70% of the volume, showed some, some improvement. Uh, you know, I would like to uh, uh, stay stay away from uh, from the counter for some time. Uh, while while the management did try their best in terms of allaying fears, while uh, what what could what was impressive though was was the cost focus, uh, also the fact that the uh, the the alumina prices, the the bauxite sourcing costs are showing uh, showing signs. And in in case there is uh, a bit of a global growth scare. Uh, you know, we could see things uh, being being very very volatile there. So stay away from me. I'm I'm not being anyways a great fan of uh, the the metal makers, both ferrous and non ferrous So I would I would stay away from uh, Vedanta because any any overhang on corporate governance in this kind of a market, uh, uh, you know, and uh, trying to be you know adventurous doesn't make sense to me. There there are better plays. There are better plays with far more earning visibility, far more secular story. I'd rather get into auto where I know that it's it's in a transition space rather than you know make a bet here. Hmm. The other one, Gurmeet, is obviously Titan. Uh, you know, the management had obviously given an update. The quarter four update was strong. They said that they're going to see sales growing by about 21 odd percent, 22 percent for the jewelry business. Uh, you know, you're probably going to see uh, you know the numbers come about some. Someone in line with these numbers, but the market has suddenly started, uh, you know, looking at the stock uh, in a slightly negative way, considering the valuations, and the, which is probably the same, uh, uh, you know, in a brush that they're painting the entire consumption space with, which is the, the heady valuations. How would you trade a titan? I mean, how would you position yourself in a titan? So I may not add too much incrementally, uh, uh, you know, on this, but I'm, I, you know, it's it's part of the core portfolio, which is which I always say is buy and forget. Uh, this year is likely to be good uh, because it's a very long wedding season as per the Hindu calendar. Uh, I personally visited one of the Titan uh, outlets uh, last week, and the waiting time was almost, and this was three days prior to Akshay Tritya. 
the waiting time was almost 45 minutes i think what 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 trend i noticed there and uh, not uh, you know is the is the shift to the uh, the light weighted uh, uh, jewelry uh, in in the middle class segment i was also surprised to see their golden harvest scheme which is the only authorized scheme other schemes obviously have been banned for the jewelers by the government has some 7 lakh customers uh, where in basically you get 70 it's like an sip if you want to draw a parallel with the mutual fund where you get the 75% of the first installment uh, on completion of 10 months so 7 lakh customers with the average ticket size of 10000 bucks uh, is 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 a monthly book of some 7 700 800 crores uh, so i think the jewelry business will grow uh, i think even the the coin sales were up i think maybe it's because of the occasion value uh, uh, there uh, the watches uh, as well as the eyewear seems to be uh, picking up jewelry also is a very very unorganized space we are now seeing a shift uh, uh, to to the better players more organized players in this segment so i'll be a, i'll be a, a you know a hold on titan may not want to accumulate them as you rightly pointed out looking at the the valuations uh but i would be keeping it part of the core portfolio any success, any further correction maybe another 10% from here could trigger some uh, you know buying opportunity yeah that's what i watch if that comes about or no titan was very volatile uh day before yesterday in yesterday's session kind of cooled off let's wait and watch what happens there just a very quick perspective uh, uh good be on avas financiers uh, do you track this one at all uh no no and not in my not in my uh tracking list i haven't okay. even looked at the numbers also okay uh, well, uh one month about 24% the last 5 or 6 days has been on a roll really as i was financiers uh, it's not an fno stock maybe got a bit up but if you, if you look at charts at all how does this one look uh, which stock are talking about avas financiers do you track it uh i don't uh, track it uh, very closely so uh, i would not be the right person but if you want to have a comment then uh, it gave a breakout up a level of uh, 1255 1260 and it's been uh, uh, in a you know on a tear and i would not recommend fresh buying but if somebody has already bought at lower levels uh, keep a stop loss of 1345 1346 is a trailing stop loss and ride it trend uh, since the breakout that we have seen a, a flag kind of pattern has been seen uh, in in the chart so there can be some more upsides Towards about fourteen fifty five, fourteen sixty, that cannot be ruled out. But I would play with trailing stop loss. Fresh entry has to be avoided. Okay, keep in mind though, um, Gaurav doesn't track it very very actively. The other, of course, uh, would, the stocks would be in focus aside of Z and Dish would be DHFL two big crack yesterday, twelve percent lower, and in the last forty five minutes to one hour suddenly sank in trade. Yeah, we'll watch out for how it opens up this morning. Pre open last one month, stocks not done a whole lot much. In fact, the entire housing finance pocket has been reeling under some amount of pressure. Uh, we wouldn't say that for probably uh, you know a uh, Canfin Homes which or a Repco Home Finance they sort of have managed to weave their way in through but that's what you've got in terms of the Asian market moves right now all in the red and so is the Asterix Nifty which is down by about half an hour percent plus 11,484. Pre-open ticks up on your screens. Uh, Nifty showing you a cut of half a knot percent plus. That's a 30 point, uh, and that, that's uh, slightly more volatile right now. So about 20 odd points. Come back to uh, the index in just a few moments. But stocks then, and we'll start off first with some of the gainers in today's session, and then we go on to. Uh, the losers so tata steel for one is showing you a 10 percent uptick we'll come back to recheck these prices in a few moments but i see i see a bank two and a half percent higher after yesterday's dip of about 1.4 odd percent despite having a decent quarter um on um at least the asset quality side titan ahead of numbers is up 1.7 percent each shifts limited spi emphasis is up one percent as well Z recovers from yesterday's uh, sell off. You've got Coal India, Wipro and HDFC Bank looking strong. Vedanta comes back uh, into the green. I think the op- just the first opening tick was a 10% cut and now it's uh, in the green settle down a bit. 4 odd percent on the upside uh, for Vedanta post numbers. Watch out closely for some of the other names that are losing. ITC is down 1.5%, Britannia 1% lower. Uh, Aisha Motors, Tata Motors, Bajaj Finance. So auto as a pocket and consumption as a pocket are looking weak this morning. For the currency, some more weakness that's come in. 69.43 uh, was the close yesterday. It's open at 69.56 right now. Okay. Um- Yeah, back to our experts and Gurmeet. I want to bring to you Siet. Maybe the stock is reacting. Maybe it isn't. But what did you make of the quarter? So uh, 
uh, while you know the numbers uh, you know time makers have been under pressure Neeraj, we saw mrf had a had a bad earning quarter i think i think the the key uh, factor obviously here is the raw material prices also one should also look at the replacement tire market i think that that plays a a very very important role uh, seat in particular i was not too disappointed if you ask me i think there if you see q on q basis uh, there is some improvement in the in the operating metrics and when the entire sector is going through a uh, you know a bit of a uh, you know uh, rough patch i think it was obvious for uh, you know the tire makers uh, to to come under pressure so you know i my, i might be look tempted to look at it uh, in case there is more uh, correction coming uh, uh, you know our way and would be a would be a buyer on dips my my you know my my strong belief is you will see a a big cyclical pick up post elections uh, uh, you know a lot of things which all negative suddenly seems to have come together whether in terms of financing whether in terms of commodity prices whether in terms of the increase in price due to uh, both uh, emission as well as safety norms i think a lot of it has come together so uh, i will be i'll be positive uh, on seat in case i see more correction but as i said a bit cautious right now in terms of only pick if there is a big bargain deal uh, coming up here there is there is a clear opportunity in banks there's a clear opportunity in telecom there is also a very very good uh, the entire capital goods space cement space looks looks very very good to me from a from even from a near term perspective which i say let's say 12 to 18 months surprise surprise the nifty and the sensex in the pre open session are not showing some down ticks uh, and i am surprised yes because i thought uh, yesterday what we did was one thing uh, i i know they you know mentioned that typically when we have a fall ahead of the global markets the next day need not be so bad but these could be early days as yet let's wait and watch if there is some further pull back into these names it's an important week some of the api players come out with numbers too so watch out for the granules and the uh, uh, solara uh, uh, names as well those could be interesting names to monitor um, gurmeet would you leave out the likes of mclord russell and everready completely or is the damage too strong and severe and therefore there might be merit in looking at them selectively uh neeraj agree with you leave it out completely uh, you know no, not look at it at all uh, you know so too many concern neeraj other than just the simple uh, you know uh, rating downgrade so uh, it's a, it's a complete avoid for me uh, I, in fact in fact lot of see, even in the nbfc space i think one needs to clearly differentiate uh, I'm, i'm sorry deviating from it is that you know nbfc with good parentage i think they will become stronger whether it is you know ab capital whether it is tata capital whether it is chola bajaj finance and nbfc with weak parentage and not wholesale funding model will get weaker so i think markets will clearly differentiate now i think i think and we are entering that phase where the differentiation will be very very strong so stay where uh, you know the the as i keep saying stay with quality okay uh let's uh, look at some of the other names and uh, you know i just want a quick uh, chart check going on a britannia from levels of about 3100 obviously in terms of the overall volumes uh, this is comparatively lesser uh, if you have to compare to the more liquid uh, names like an hul or for that matter even an itc but what would you do here um, gorov bissa in britannia more short uh, shorts can come in at these levels i would not uh, recommend shorting because uh, it's been falling from high levels we already seen uh, short positions getting built uh, at uh, from levels of 3050 3100 but the risk for would not be that favorable i would look for buying up early but then again i would not be buying at the current prices but uh, uh, any dip towards levels of 2600 2610 uh, maybe at those levels we one can uh, initiate to buy uh, some amount of uh, long positions over there the stop loss at 2580 the levels of 2620 is sustained 27 to 25 27 40 is what i would be looking at uh, 2655 and counting uh, britannia has certainly had the nifty curse the one that is reacting devina um, early morning uh, trades and uh, still couple of minutes left so don't quite know how it will end the pre open session is vedanta a post results uh, the num- uh, the verdict on the screen 4% lower 157 we spoke to gurmi then he of course mentioned that he'll stay away but uh, there were some positive outcomes in the results It's just that brokerages have such a mixed view on this one, and, and street is a bit nervous about what's happening to commodities by and large. That this one starts off about four percent lower in trade. We've talked about this fundamentally. Maybe Gurmeet believes it's a good thing to avoid this one because there's no clear clarity on what the earnings trajectory would be. Chandan Taparia, if I can ask you for a trade here on a Vedanta. 
Yes, uh, if you look at the metal counter, uh, we have seen uh, the price formation of lower top, lower bottom formation in Vedanta, while Hindalco witnessed some consolidating move. Uh, but the entire market is down and global indices are also under the pressure, so I think the weakness could continue. Vedanta, which is continuously making lower highs, lower lows from last five trading sessions, can continue to drip towards next support of 158, 157. So now till it remains below 172 level, the weakness could continue for the lower levels in this counter. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's Vedanta for you. Uh, a, a fairly uh, a volatile pre-open itself. Opened 10% lower, then went 4% high, and now it's down 2% uh, yet again. That's Vedanta for you. Um, the other pocket, uh, the other stock rather, is Reliance Industries. Yesterday saw a big mm. sharp drop, and being the heavyweight that it is of over 10% uh, weightage on the index, it's it's capable of single-handedly pulling down the index. Uh, and if you join HDFC Limited and HDFC Bank to the party, uh, then it just uh, goes down. Which is what happened, I think, yesterday. Yeah, yeah, it happened yesterday. But the big 3% cut for Reliance Industries uh, in a single trading session. Uh, Chandan Taparia, from being above 1,400 to around 1,340-odd where Reliance is trading at, would that prompt you to probably look at these lower levels to enter the stock? Yes, yesterday the entire the bear have taken the advantage of pulling the Reliance industry lower. This stock was holding well comparatively, and still it is in a consolidative win. But yesterday it fell down sharply. That also supported the broader indices. This counter is still now higher than its 50-day exponential moving average, and in last leg uh, it respected to its major support of 1313-1320 level. So I'll wait for decline near to 1320-1313 level, and if it manages to hold, then I'll take a contra trade and I'll go with the buying activity near to those levels. So I think in this decline, if Reliance goes near to the support zone, then contract can be taken for an up move towards 1400 going forward. The other one is Maruti now. That's coming back towards that uh, support zone of 64, 6500 that we've been seeing in the past few occasions. Currently about 66, 79, but coming off from levels of about 7300. So that's again uh, a decent enough pullback uh, for a Maruti Suzuki. Uh, gives you that trading window. Uh, Gaurav Bissa, do you think that this time around, if Maruti once again comes levels of about 6,400, you could use history to take another trade on the stock? Well, 6,400 would not be a good price uh, for the stock for the reason that uh, uh, it's been finding good supports at level of 6,500, 6,550. And if there's a breakdown below levels of 6,500, we can talk about the triple top, uh, bottom breakdown. Or uh, there can be a crucial break on long term charts as well, and then it can slip towards the uh, 6,200, 6,100. But I think uh, any dip of 100 points from the current levels can be utilized to build fresh longs. Uh, keep a stop of 6,550 on the upside. One can expect 7,000. Conversely, if somebody wants to buy at higher levels, even that would look good. Uh, if the stock manages to trade above 6,800, there will be a small breakout on hourly charts. One can keep a stop loss of 6,720 then and play for targets of 7,000. Hmm. Okay. Jaman Sion, uh, minutes away from market open, let's tell our viewers all that they need to know to stay ahead in trade today. A strong performance by Vedanta, Zinc and Aluminum business drove its March quarter performance. The company's oil and gas business outperformed as well. However, volumes cap profits, the stock likely to start off a couple of percentage points lower in trade. Titan will be the only nifty company to report earnings today. Strong sales in the jewellery business will likely have resulted in a strong performance for this quarter. Watch out for Reliance Communications today as the National Company Law Tribunal has begun insolvency proceedings against the company. In a company statement released yesterday, SL Group says that the stake sale talks in Z Entertainment are at advanced stages. BSC, Bombay Stock Exchange, the company reports poor earnings but announces a buyback worth 460 crore rupees at 680 rupees per share. And lastly, amongst key block deals, Sunil Mittal purchased 1.1% stake in CG Power at a price of 36 rupees per share. Yeah, this is interesting and it continues. Uh, personal investments by a lot of marquee corporate houses into other companies. And we've seen this happening with CG Power for sure the last few days, especially when it comes to Sunil Bharti Mittal. It's an interesting one to monitor for sure. I think uh, Yes Bank also picked, uh, you know, got about eight crore shares of CG Power. Yeah, due to, uh, I think, a revocation of the pledge Pro of I'm not promoters. Wrong. Yeah. Promoters, yeah. Uh, Gurmeet, have you looked at this one? It's it's now uh, in news for a number of reasons, and not all yeah. of them fundamentally linked to the company's performance alone. Seems to be a deep value bargain by uh, uh, Niraj and uh, 
so uh, you know i i i'll avoid this phase again uh, so, uh, you know very rare stages in the market where your avoid list is probably much much longer than your buy list uh, so uh, come avoid for me yeah so you know been in the news for all the wrong reasons uh, uh, including yesterday's news of yes bank also in working pledge uh, the uh, the sunil bharti news might give a bit of a uh support to the stock at certain price we saw that with uh, if you remember the food and in when uh, radha krishna dhawani had picked up uh, that's like in a in a in a company so you know you have to evaluate that uh, uh, yourself some marquee name picking up a stake can give you a, a slight price movement for for a day or so but eventually you have to evaluate for yourself so uh, i would not i would probably study this a little more and maybe can come back to you but avoid for now okay Oh, mm-hmm. it's EG Power for now. I'm not surprised. I'm just saying that the stock is in such uh, news for the last so many uh, um, weeks that it becomes an interesting one to monitor. As the pre-open rates have settled down, Vedanta is the top loser. Z is likely to be the top gainer, but that's hardly any gains. I mean, just marginally in the green. But that's a respite compared to what the stock has done the last few days. So keep that at the back of your mind too. And yes, Bank. looks like starting off on a flat note so not too too much of a movement happening in the indian markets just that they are likely to start off not as poorly as what was anticipated earlier gorav bisa you were making this point uh, that uh, the trade that you will take today will depend on how the market start the pre open rate seem to suggest that we'll have a flattish start and not a half a percent lower start what's an apt index strategy if you can uh, reiterate that very quickly uh for me uh, any jump towards the of 11520 can be sold if a stop loss of 30.7550 on downside 11460 would be the first target below that 11420 would be the second target okay uh, only on a jump chandan very quickly 20 seconds if you want to reiterate uh, your yeah. option strategy is fine on yes. the futures are you doing anything with the nifty starting off flat today Yeah, yeah, till it remains below eleven thousand five fifteen, the support. I'll continue to be for downside. Move to us eleven thousand four twenty three thirty three level. So suggesting to be with eleven thousand five hundred put weekly for to play the downside. Okay, that's on the index yet again. If we have a flattish open, fifty nine seconds left to go for market pre open. And we're quickly going to get some top trading ideas from both the technical experts. Chandan, let's keep it with you first. Uh, which is that one stock that you'll go with? Yes, uh, uh, selected to be with uh, two trade, and I think better to uh, do such kind of trade because because uh, the market is like to be volatile. So suggesting to be with buying on LNT and selling in Asian Paint. LNT here showing some sign of strength for a move towards fourteen ten. Gaurav Bissa, what about you? I would be buying uh, Mahindra and Mahindra. The bullish currently formation that is seen on daily charts looks quite promising. Buy about in the future segment. Buy about six forty. Stop loss of six thirty two. Target of six sixty to six sixty five. Okay, Jaman. If you can stay on, we'll just take in opening thoughts for you post market open, and then uh, uh, re- relieve you. But this is how uh, the markets, uh, or just waiting for the markets to kickstart trade. We'll have a start which is flattish if the pre-open rates are to be believed. The question mark only is, will it stay that way, or will it succumb to some selling? Uh, let's figure out. Flat start, maybe a bit worse than what the pre-open session was suggesting. About a third of a percent for the Sensex, about a third of a percent for the Nifty as well. The Nifty Bank, uh, 120 odd points, so quickly drifting lower. I mean, a little bit of a, a false indication. The pre-open rates, uh, the SJX proved to be a more worthy indicator because we are half a percent lower for the benchmark indices. Uh, the mid caps and the small caps, I reckon, would also be weak. Uh, Actually, the mid caps are down about a third of a percent. The small cap index very, very flat. Well, let's see what happens during the course of the first five minutes of the first half an hour. Right now, seems to be a bit choppy. Uh, the heat map and a similar picture to day before yesterday, uh, wherein there's a lot of red, very little green. Not too many gainers. Keep that at the back of your mind. We don't even have Z, which was amongst the top gainers in the pre-open session. It's lying absolutely dormant, flattish in trade. So that announcement has done. Well, okay, it's done one thing, which is stop the stem. of the fall uh, stem the fall but hasn't quite done too much otherwise gale coal india power grade uh, some psus are doing okay but otherwise no hearty gains what about losers vedanta corrects it's about 2.5% post results uh, top loser tata motors continues to be under pressure by the way mind you in the us markets too the global trade exposed stocks caterpillars of the world corrected quite strongly yesterday you could well have that phenomenon in india as well the companies which have a large deri- de- derivation of, of the income from the global market at Tata Motors Madras and Sumi etc could remain under pressure Reliance is under pressure too uh, and from amongst the banking heavyweights i think HDFC 
Kotak Mahindra Bank are a couple of names that are looking like being under pressure. Britannia continues on its way down too. So not too many stocks gaining and some key names like Reliance losing out. That's the start and the Nifty is now trading at the lowest point of the day, 0.6% lower. Very quickly, a uh, couple of pockets that I wanted to highlight. Stocks that were amongst the top losers in trade yesterday. I think we should bring those out. Uh, DHFL was amongst the principal losers and starts off another 3% lower. Dish TV, some respite after the car of the crack yesterday and Balram Puccini which had a 6% downtick uh, starts off another uh, quarter of a percent, three quarters of a percent in the red. Uh, any results impact seen? Maybe a couple of stocks that I can highlight. Siet as well as Brigitte. Uh, Brigitte starts off 2% higher so I'm glad we pointed that out. Siet though is not seeing any kind of negative repercussions despite the quarter looking a bit soft. Devina, what are you spotting? Well, we start off uh, <coughs> with what's losing and Vodafone Idea for one is uh, the top loser on the Nifty 500 and that's down about 4 odd percent. Following that, we have a Shrey Infra which is down 3.8 percent, almost 4 percent now. Divan Housing Finance, remember yesterday we spoke about how the stock uh, gave up in the second half of trade. Stocks carried forward those losses about 3.5 percent on Divan Housing Finance. Um, then you've got the likes of a PC Jewelers. Uh, last few days you saw actually a turnaround and recovery for the stock which takes PC Jewelers monthly tally to 31 percent positive. But I think now the trend is reversed. This is very typical of PC Jewelers. You've seen it running up a few days in a, on a trot, big gains, and then the similar thing happens when it starts moving lower. Uh, quality, the lip build on some of the other losers. Uh, smaller names like Spark, you've got Groove Finance, which is down about 2 odd percent as well in the session. Amongst the gainers, uh, you've got uh, uh, Reliance on Arcom, which has moved up. You've got RCF, which is up 4.5%. Jyoti Labs, Alembic Pharma, so some of the smaller pharma names doing okay. McLeod Russell takes a breather from the kind of uh, cuts that it's seen. Gale, Biocon, Coal India uh, are some of the other gainers. Dish TV also recovers. So um, Z Learn, Dish TV, both these stocks in yesterday's session were, uh, uh, you know, with heavy knocks. Today's session, I think Z Learn's unchanged but Dish TV has picked up a marginal bit. Uh, breadth is very negative, 876 stocks have declined, 257 stocks advancing. Okay, um, well on that note, um, thank all our experts for staying by um, and, and giving us your thoughts, um, fundamental and technicals as well. Gentlemen, all of you, thanks much for taking the time out and being with us, uh, just about in line with what uh, the pre-open rates were, or rather the SEX Nifty was indicating. Um, let's talk about uh, what the charts indicate over the next uh, few weeks, if we can. Uh, Gautam Shah, Associate Director at JM Financial Services, joins us right now on the show. The idea of getting Gautam today was that when we spoke at the BQ Edge event in Chennai, Gautam was fairly sanguine about the prospects over the medium term. Uh, the scene seems to have turned a bit very in the short term. And Gautam, that's the whole question. Uh, the long term may look okay. I was just wondering if your near term charts indicate any kind of nervousness because yesterday the market looked very, very nervous. Uh, yes, Neeraj, uh, I think it's not really too much about the charts. I think the screen might uh, bring in a lot of uh, nervousness and the, and the kind of pricing that you're seeing in options. I think that's uh, only adding to uh, the ambiguity in the marketplace. But I think I'm pretty clear that you need to understand uh, the Nifty had a phenomenal run-up from 10,600 to, to 11,750, 11,800 odd levels. And 11,750 was the level from where we began the big correction in October last year. So it was quite uh, uh, obvious that the market would have seen some selling pressure there. Uh, this correction that is happening right now could have happened a month back, but the market saw time correction for the last three, three and a half weeks. And now we are going through a phase of price correction. Again, just to put things in perspective, this this looks like a very normal correction because a simple 38% retracement of the entire rise of 1,200 points comes to about 11,400. So just going by very simple technical studies, I think this correction should be considered normal. Yes, it might not look great on the screen, but I think somewhere around the 11,400 mark, this market would become a buy once again. And many of the technical studies, which were very, very overbought a couple of weeks back, have started moving to the oversold zone. To add to that, I think the sentiment of the market has been completely broken with uh, what has happened in the last two or three days. The market is extremely light on speculative positions and extremely heavy on hedge positions. 
So in this kind of an environment, I really do not see major downside. A lot of technicians looking at the short-term charts would wonder whether yesterday's uh, price action was a breakdown. I don't think that's the correct way to look at it. Even if it is, it was a breakdown, it might lead to a 100, 150 point decline more from current levels, but nothing substantial. But since the weekly chart, the monthly setup of the market continues to be very positive and we still maintain our target of 12,222. I think anything around 11,400 plus plus minus 50 points, I think is a buying opportunity for a much uh, bigger target in the days ahead. Gautam, uh, how, how, do, how do these scenarios typically play out when uh, positions on the futures are very light and positions on the hedges are very, very heavy? Uh, how does the unraveling happen? And in this scenario, if it were to happen, either pre-election verdict or post-election verdict, uh, would you believe it will be a very sharp, swift move? Or will participants get a chance to participate? Well, I'm sure it's going to be a sharp and swift move. Uh, you know, I was just discussing this with a number of analysts yesterday that in the past when the market was so light and so uh, on speculative positions and heavy on hedge positions, how has it played out? You know, typically, uh, this is more positive than negative because I think people are extremely fearful. Uh, margins on the exchanges have gone up quite a bit and therefore that's anyway not allowing a lot of participants to get in uh, in a big way. And given the kind of premiums that you have right now, I think uh, people are very jittery about uh, uh, taking positions. So as I said, since the market is a lot more prepared for a negative eventuality, you know, or a possible negative eventuality in the next uh, uh, two, two and a half weeks, I think, uh, you know, this market will find a floor uh, very easily. And that's probably the reason I don't see much decline. Let me add to this, uh, global markets have had a phenomenal run themselves in the last one, one and a half months. If you look at most markets, they have gained about 20% from their recent lows, and they were ripe for a pullback. The, the pullback came thanks to the excuse from uh, from the tweet from the president. But I think even the global market pullback should uh, settle down in a few days. That's what the charts are suggesting. And if that happens, I think India can back, get back on track uh, very easily. The only negative, as I see right now, is the market breadth. Because while the Nifty might still be at 11.5, I think the kind of damage that we've seen across the board is, is quite uh, discouraging. But I'm sure that this disconnect between the large caps and the mid caps will gradually get settled, possibly uh, around the election results time. Hmm. Uh, you know, while this is about the index, and you just highlighted that the broader market space, the damage is far more concentrated than what we've seen uh, for the index itself. Uh, that's where the crux of it lies, because it's the individual stocks that a regular uh, a person takes a position in. Uh, how would one approach uh, you know, individual counters that are seeing the kind of sell-off that they have in the recent past. And it's not just uh, sector-specific like consumption where all of the stocks have started to move lower or cement as a pocket where most of the stocks have started to move higher. So, you know, you have to be very picky and choosy. Well, there are two points here. Number one, you don't catch a falling knife. I think we've seen that in the last uh, uh, many months and particularly in 2018 when the best of names with the best of fundamentals in the mid-cap space lost 40, 50, 60 percent just like that. So that cannot be a basis to go along. I think the price action needs to show some strength, which has been missing in the mid-cap space. But also let's realize that the mid-cap index rallied from 16,000 all the way to 18,500, uh, which is a good two and a half thousand point rise in the last couple of months. And that rise, I think, is just getting digested. And around the 17,000 mark on the mid-cap index, I think you will have the bulls uh, coming in once again. But as I just highlighted, there is so much pessimism suddenly in just two trading sessions that the market is just getting lighter and lighter by the day and it will only help it create a you know much stronger foundation once the next leg up starts and i'm very clear looking at the medium term charts that the mid cap index will rebound from here in fact we have a target of about 20000 20500 on the mid cap 100 index possibly in the next one year so that's a good 30% 35% uh, uh, to play for and I think the SIP money angle, you know, the fact that 9,000 crores is coming into the system every month, I think that's chasing the top 20 stocks. And that's probably the reason the top 20, 30 stocks have been very, very steady. And every time there is a smallish decline, you know, they find a lot of support. I think that that's the only real explanation that one can have right now. All right. Uh, you know, I just want to um, uh, pull up 
what's been happening to Maruti Gautam and, and this is uh, you know a, a, a stock that is difficult to understand with the kind of moves that it has been making I mean fundamentally whatever has been happening to the auto pocket as a whole uh, individual stocks within the auto pocket deserve attention and Maruti is the only one that's been in terms of the volatility that the stock price has seen uh, the highs that it has made compared to the lows where it's trading at right now how does one approach this well, clearly, it's been an underperformer. It's a stock that is not moving with the market. It's a stock that goes down every time the market sees a little bit of a dip. And therefore, you don't want to just be brave and be a buyer just because it has fallen 20-30% from the top. I think Maruti has been a debate in our office as well, uh, you know, between the fundamental and technical analysts. And I, I would, I'm strongly of the view that uh, while Maruti was a poster boy uh, stock for, for the last couple of years, giving almost multi-bagger returns for a large cap stock, I think the times have changed. And I think the market needs to realize that, that the, that the kind of leadership that many of these auto stocks had, I think that that's really changed. Probably in the auto space, the only stock that we like is Bajaj Auto. I think it's been one of the steadier names in the marketplace. And in, in this market, you know, you just want to buy the names that are showing relative strength or which are outperforming. So, you know, the top five names in the banking space, some of the capital goods stocks, some of the oil and gas stocks, I think they are the ones, you know, which we are recommending to our clients. Auto com remains a complete avoid uh, for us. And Maruti, given what it has done, I think there could be more uh, pain in store in the days and weeks ahead. Okay. Gautam wouldn't want you to make too many predictions ahead of uh, the verdict. It comes out in about 20 days. You usually don't come too often. But this time around, I'll urge you to make an exception and talk to us post May 23rd to try and make better sense of what the long term charts are indicating. And I look forward to that. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Gautam. Thanks for joining in today and giving us your perspective. Really appreciate it. Well, that's uh, an important uh, technical voice. Gautam Shah of JM Financial looks at long-term charts, believes 11,400 could be a level from where people could buy. Okay, uh, before we hit that break, though, uh, one more important voice. No deal between China and the U.S. is better than a bad deal, says the chairman and CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, Jamie Dimon. Speaking to Bloomberg News, Stephen Engel in Beijing, Diamond says both sides have made considerable progress in resolving differences, but Donald Trump's latest tweet has made it just harder for the two sides to sign on the dotted line. Listen in. I think they, we raised the tension a little bit, but from everything I hear, they've made enormous progress, like hundreds of pages of detailed agreements around IP, technology, subsidies, standard enterprises, tariffs, and some form of enforcement. And now we've had this little kind of another bump in the road. And, uh, you know, sometimes these tweets don't pan out to be as bad. Uh, I don't think they get the deal done by Friday, and I'm hoping they don't put tariffs in place. I hope they finish the agreement. But, it, but it took, whatever the odds were before, like I think it's still 80% they'll get it done. The odds of something bad happening is now doubled. Whatever you thought they were, if it was 2% or 5%, 10%, is probably doubled. Is and, that, and that's why the markets are reacting to it, because they're not just afraid of the direct effect, the rate of, the, the, if it reverses global trade. It can slow down global growth, it can hurt a lot of economies around the world. And, well, it and, could. I mean, the IMF already is projecting global growth for the world to be at its lowest pace since the global financial crisis, and that's with the China deal. Yeah. Do you think it could be as dire as that, worse than that, if this trade deal... Well, I, I think I think that the world economy is actually doing okay. You know, China's going at 6.5%. That's a trillion dollars of growth. America's going, it looks like, almost 3%. That's half a trillion dollars of growth. So, yeah, the glow has slowed down a little bit, but it's still active. And But one of the fly in the ointment would be this. If this goes really south, I think that could change uh, uh, global growth. Do you feel the talks, though, perhaps, are getting a little bit of a louder voice in the White House? And also, even here, too, as there is a bit of a pushback to the comments coming from Donald Trump. And in that sense, do you hang tough or do you haggle for a less than ideal deal? I think you, I, I think both sides should do what's in their own best interest. And, and you know, I, so hang tough, yeah, I think there are serious issues. I think they need to be seriously resolved. I think they've made a lot of progress in doing that. I think it's good for both the Chinese and the Americans. So neither side has to do something. I think it's a mistake. Like, and I think it's a terrible error to say, well, it's because we're doing better in the economy. Just get the proper trade deal done. And it's, it may take a little bit more time, but I think we should do the proper trade deal. I'd rather not do a deal than do a bad deal. 
think that's a bad idea for America and for China. And remember, Japan and Europe also have a vested interest in this. So we, we're not really coordinating with them, but they certainly would like to see a proper trade deal uh, done between China and America, and then they can support it. You think they can overcome the big differences, and that is getting a verifiable timetable for implementation of their pledges, as well as a reversing of the forced technology transfers and some of the other big issues on intellectual property, right? Yeah. I don't think there's anything that can't be resolved. I mean, you, China's already opened up a lot of its industries, so I think they had 100 protected industries, and we have like 25, and they've been doing that anyway. They need uh, reform in their own markets for, for bond markets and equity markets, for transparency, rule of law, they need that too. So I don't expect the Chinese to do anything that's in our interest. I think they can do it's in their own self-interest, but I think these things are in their own self-interest. And I think Americans shouldn't blow out of proportion. A lot of state-owned enterprises don't do well. So while you don't want really unfair competition, let's, let's not blow it completely out of proportion. You know, a country like China is allowed to have industrial policy. I wish America had better industrial policy. So let's let, let them work it out. And I think, infrastructure. I think you have no. very smart people on both sides trying to work this out. anything and everything about your investments. We're just a touch away. Monday to Friday at 12.30 p.m. Only on Bloomberg Quint. This is a show which gets you a complete trap of all the stocks that are buzzing in trade. Everyone's a price taker, not a price maker out there. There are better opportunities in the marketplace. The return ratios will improve, margins will improve. What are you seeing? Valuations are extremely expensive. It would take 100 years of profits to really pay off the entire debt. Not all good businesses are good investments. Good return on equity could be expected. And I think that is sustained. Their numbers, etc., were pretty sluggish. How much longer they can sustain, I'm not too sure. It has never been the scenario with any of the stocks. It's an avoid for him at this point of time. I wouldn't write it off in such a hurry. They're getting into more complex chemistry. Join me as I navigate the hottest stocks and help you pick the right stock at the right time. Let's talk about earnings. Uh, welcome back. Of course, you're with us on Indian Open. And BSE stop line missed estimates in quarter four, declining 20% almost from a period year ago. But the stock exchange has plans to reward shareholders. A dividend of 25 rupees per share has been declared in addition to a buyback plan. Shall I do better chat with the managing director and CEO Ashish Kumar Chauhan? And the first question was on the company's cash position to fulfill these plans. Listen in. Uh, BSE uh, did this IPO. Um, a few years back and that time also BSE didn't do uh, actually new share issuance. It was an offer for sale because BSE has a very large uh, cash surplus in its balance sheet. Uh, currently uh, it is around 1800 crore rupees uh, as uh, unencumbered cash uh, reserves in its balance sheet. So 25% is the maximum allowed which is what uh, close to that board has uh, approved uh, and almost 460 crore rupees of uh, buyback at 680 rupees per share. Uh, would uh, has been proposed to the AGM. AGM is uh, proposed on July 15th, so after the approval, uh, BSE will uh, do the tender process uh, to uh, complete uh, the buyback. Almost 13% of the existing shares uh, will be bought back and extinguished uh, going forward, which means 87% uh, shares uh, will remain uh, 
uh, for and that will increase uh, the EPS assuming uh, the performance to be similar to uh, current so it will basically increase that much performance by that many uh, numbers uh, so overall BSC still has uh, even post uh, the buyback itself BSC will have a large number of uh, large amount of uh, uh, unencumbered cash uh, in its balance sheet going forward. Uh, so I would like to ask about the controversy which is happening in the NSC. So you are expecting any kind of a market share gain for your exchange in terms of revenue? The BSC has been uh, basically managing itself on a uh, on its own. We don't comment on uh, what happens to the other exchange, but overall the regulatory structure which BSC has established ensures that uh, BSC continues to provide uh, the best technology at the lowest cost uh, to the, the broking fraternity as well as the investing fraternity. Uh, sir, IPOs have started coming in and there is a buzz in the primary market. So if you can give us the details for your listing fees, how much you have earned over this quarter? Uh, basically, uh, there are uh, two yeah there are two types of corporate services uh, which we provide. One is the uh, annual listing fee, which is uh, all the listed companies end up paying to us, uh, and then there is a listing fees which is a little seasonal, as in when the IPOs come or rights issues come, then the companies pay to BSE uh, for uh, using its software services and other activities, and that's where uh, in 2017-18 BSE had a very large. Uh, uh, revenue coming from IPOs. Last year, the entire last fiscal had very few IPOs and because of that, BSE saw a very low level of uh, revenues coming from there. Uh, this year, uh, in case the IPOs uh, start coming up uh, well, then BSE is uh, a dominant player in the IPO distribution framework uh, and that's where BSE will probably uh, benefit uh, better compared to other exchanges in terms of the IPO. Similarly, Star MF platform of BSE is a very well accepted platform. It has become the largest distribution platform for uh, the mutual funds. It has uh, 24,000 direct IFS and almost 200,000 indirect uh, people uh, doing investments uh, or making uh, investors do investment through BSE Star MF platform. And that, uh, I think, uh, is also growing uh, more than 100% year on year for the last 10 years. We started charging last year first time. Uh, last year itself, we got uh, 29, 30 crore uh, rupees of uh, uh, revenues from that being a first year. It was a very heartening thing. Next year, uh, we hope to do uh, much better. So overall, uh, we see uh, the investment activities as and when uh, that picks up, uh, BSC will do well. Uh, and the small stocks, uh, which did not do so well because of the way the mutual funds had to uh, do selling in the small stocks due to the uh, new classification uh, for mutual funds that came into place. It uh, reduced our overall uh, transaction charges coming from small stocks. Uh, this year, uh, in fact, Q4, it started uh, going up, and this year also we continue to uh, do well in uh, that segment. So overall, uh, this year uh, and the Q4 was better than uh, Q3 uh, in 2018-19. Sir, in terms of your average daily turnover, how has the performance been for your equity segment as well as your currency segment? In currency segment, we grew up uh, uh, quite a lot. Uh, we became a dominant player uh, and we continue to be dominant player in uh, the currency segment uh, even in uh, April, May. Uh, in terms of the equities, uh, we have a, a very small market share uh, uh, which uh, in, in a way converted to uh, the revenues has two parts. One is uh, almost 50% of our uh, transaction charges is to come from small stocks which are exclusive to BSE which uh, uh, suffered uh, quite badly uh, last year. Uh, they have started coming up. So this year, hopefully we will have a larger uh, amount coming out of uh, the transaction charges. Uh, we'll continue to do uh, sort of similar or well if market goes up in uh, the larger stocks, but the smaller stocks is where we uh, get more uh, income from uh, listing fees as well as more income from the transaction charges. And sir, lastly, what is your general outlook going into FY20? Now you see the new chairman also, Justice Vikramjit Sen will be coming in. So how do you think it will pan out for the exchange as a whole? Justice Vikramjit Sen uh, has been on the BSC board uh, for last uh, around uh, three years. Um, he has been uh, elected as a chairman uh, on uh, the board meeting and we have applied to uh, SEBI for his approval. Uh, but uh, he has been in the BSC board, so he knows the 
uh, the issues which BSC has as well as, well as the opportunities BSC has and uh, he has been very supportive of uh, the, the steps we BSC has taken to give clean, most regulated, uh, transparent, efficient, uh, uh, very low cost, uh, very high tech markets uh, to the entire country. Uh, and that will uh, perhaps uh, going forward continue. BSE has uh, taken uh, the onus of being the most regulated exchange on itself and uh, having selected such an eminent personality uh, as uh, retired justice of Supreme Court. Sri Vikramjit Sen uh, tells you uh, volumes about uh, BSE's uh, commitment to providing very, very clean market uh, to India uh, going forward. All right, that's the management of Bombay Stock Exchange. The stock, unfortunately, not reacting too well. I must say the markets, too, uh, are now trading in and around the lowest point of the day. Um, actually, the, they kind of did this last 15 minutes ago and still, do, still staying low, so no attempt at a pullback. And from amongst the larger names, Z Entertainment uh, is now down another 1.5%. So they may have released a statement stating that the deal is very close to fructifying, but it is not having any impact on the stock. I think the worry in the market seems to be largely that whatever deal happens will happen at a price much lower than what the street would earlier have been believing. Uh, that is something that is keeping Z plagued. So keep that at the back of your mind when you're watching the stock of Z Entertainment. Reliance continues to remain under pressure. We were talking about it in the morning as well, but after the 3% gash yesterday, Another percent and a half gone, so 1322, that's a heavyweight which is correcting, so keep that at the back of your mind. And HUL has corrected about a half a percent or thereabouts too, so yesterday was a decent day for HUL, somehow not quite able to live up to that in the session today. The broader markets are okay, we don't have too many cuts really. The top loser is Cox and Kings which is down just about 5 percent, so there the damage is not too, not too severe, but the large caps certainly, uh, selective stocks and heavyweights too. Are, are really under some bit of pressure within the first half an hour of trade. So, slightly wobbly. The Banks gain, are doing okay. Yeah, the gainer is the one in the broad market space, uh, you know, the likes of Jet Airways, that one's up about 3.5% uh, <clears throat> on a day where the market has dropped about half an hour percent at open. Divan Housing Finance recovers a bit. Jet Airways actually started off negative, and you've seen that spike happening right now, and so did Divan Housing Finance. So both of these stocks have seen a recovery over the last few minutes of trade. Um, you've got uh, the likes of an Edelweiss also in the green. Brigade, you would anticipate it to do well on the back of its results and that 75% bump up in its sales and revenue numbers, uh, which have prompted uh, a positive open and a, a positive, uh, you know, it's being held on to the gains. So 234 for Brigade. Uh, Inox Leisure, now remember, um, we're going to see um, the numbers come out over the next few days. I think on the 13th of May is when Inox's numbers get reported. Uh, it's going to be an interesting watch because quarter four had been relatively strong in terms of the content pipeline. Uh, anticipation and the forward-looking outlook for quarter one will likely be even more stronger uh, because you would have uh, the Avengers movie that goes down into uh, quarter one for Inox. So we'll watch out for that one and even PVR uh, and how these, both these stocks uh, will perform. Blue Star, okay. You've got uh, Ever Ready, both Ever Ready and McLeod. Uh, were uh, McLeod Russell were the companies that saw he heavy thrashing over the last few trading sessions, uh, a marginal recovery. McLeod Russell, okay, up a circuit for that one, um, but uh, ever ready, just another percent, percent and a half on the upside for the counter. Canfin Homes is the other one. Remember, we were talking about how pressure has been building up in the housing finance companies, particularly the likes of Divan Housing Finance to an extent, uh, even India Bulls Housing Finance. But smaller names like Repco and Canfin have been charting their own course. And Repco in today's session also is up. Uh, while, uh, sorry, uh, Canfin Homes is up in the session, not Repco. Uh, that one is up, I think, one and a half, one, one point two odd percent right now. Uh, talking about uh, earnings performances, uh, Hester Biosciences has posted a strong performance in the March quarter. Margins expanded in both poultry and animal healthcare segments. But exports declined over 40% against the same period last year. So had it not been for a strong growth in the domestic market, earnings could have actually slipped a little bit more. And to know more about the quarter gone by, let's welcome in the Managing Director and CEO, Mr. Rajiv Gandhi. Um, Rajiv, thanks very much for taking out the time. I want to first off itself go across and find out what went wrong with regards to the exports and, and why such weak numbers. Uh, with regards exports, uh, the, the reasons have been more external rather than internal. Uh, 
registration, organization of the distribution network, uh, um, uh, sort of getting confirmation of payments. And as uh, you are aware, we are dealing in markets in countries in Africa. So with that, there are many more variables which we are trying to address. Uh, having said that, I do admit that there has been um, uh, an unexpected lower uh, sales in exports, but we have put things in the right place in the last six months. Um, and hopefully these things will change in the next six to eight months time. What you're saying is you could still face pressure in at least quarter one of FY20 if you're saying things will start to normalize in the next six to eight months. So quarter one could I, also witness yes. some pain. Yes, uh, the first quarter would also be a little bit uh, weak uh, and then it should definitely catch up in the second, third and fourth because the groundwork has already been done in all this time when the sales have been poor, a lot of groundwork has been done by us. Hmm. Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit more about the overall business outlook and, you know, the other aspects that we're talking about, that's the poultry business and uh, the animal health care revenues. Animal health care revenues have been pretty strong for you. Is that the course that you're going to chart over the next few quarters as well? And margins have expanded considerably on that front as well. Uh, till recently, till four years ago, we were only a poultry vaccine company and we started these uh, this other division just four years ago the animal health uh, the market is in a way bigger than the poultry health market and our focus is now going to be on the animal health we believe that in the next three to four years time the animal health uh, division would be equal to the poultry division in terms of uh, top line and secondly, in the animal health, we are now producing and marketing vaccines like uh, PPR, vaccines against the PPR disease in sheep and goat, brucella disease in cattle. These two have been taken up by the government of India and PPR also by United Nations under FAO for eradication. So we believe that there will be a big spurt in demand in vaccines uh, for the animal health division. And uh, yes, the uh, course of action is to gain more and more market share in the animal health division. In poultry, we are already having around 35% market share in the country and the industry grows at around less than 10%. We are sure that we will grow above that, but the bigger chunk of business is expected from the animal health division. With these two vaccinations that you just spoke about, you would have done some uh, forward-looking calculations as to, you know, how much you uh, you can expect in terms of, uh, you know, push for these two vaccinations and how much would that translate into the actual numbers? Uh, these two vaccines have a potential today with uh, the limited demand and with the awareness programs yet in place. Uh, the uh, total potential for these two vaccines alone is more than 50 crore uh, Indian rupees. I'm talking of domestic business. And brucella is a very big problem in Africa. We have yet to register this vaccine in various countries and we foresee a good market uh, also from the African continent. Okay, so this 50 crores that you're saying that is, uh, um, you know, the potential for this uh, particular vaccine is just domestic, uh, which is almost 100% of your revenue right now that you're talking about. And this is over the yes, period of absolutely. next year, the entire year? Uh, this is the market potential. The uh, cattle and the sheep population in the country is very much dispersed. Yeah, there are small holder farmers more than the organized. In fact, in sheep and goat, there is hardly anybody who is doing organized farming. This is the potential as per the animal population. We are working hard towards creating awareness, creating demand. Each state government is also having its uh, disease awareness and immunization programs. It would not be possible to touch this potential in one year's time or maybe in two years time but definitely in three years time we could have this potential and by the time the market would have also grown okay got that um, just uh, you know one last question with regards to um, these two you've already highlighted these two vaccinations any other products in the pipeline for you that have have as big a potential uh, we 
Uh, no, the vaccines which we are looking at uh, at the moment in uh, the cattle, there are two, three vaccines which are uh, there. But uh, at the moment, uh, we would like to leave it from the time when we will uh, enter the market with those vaccines rather than talk about it right now. But yes, there are a few va vaccines in the pipeline. All right. Uh, Mr. Gandhi, we'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for joining us uh, uh, and giving us an update on your quarterly performance. So, yes, exports have witnessed uh, a, a dip this time around, and that pain could likely continue over the next six to eight months as well. Oh, let's wait and watch what happens there with uh, Hester Bio. And let's also try and figure out what's happening to real estate because the housing market has had its fair share of turmoil while the larger organized players make inroads of late. Prices have also moderated, but that doesn't mean it's become affordable across the country. Knight Frank recently came out, excuse me, came out with a survey based on affordability and average apartment sizes, which shows that the average apartment size has also shrunk. Is it because builders have turned focus to affordable housing? Well, lots of things to talk about. Let's try and put some of these into perspective. Gulam Zia, Executive Director at Knight Frank, joins us right now on the show. Gulam, good having you. Thanks much for joining in Neeraj here. Very interesting note, uh, uh, Gulam, put out by you. Um, I just want to start off with uh, whether you believe that the prima facie reason why the, the size of the units and not necessarily the pricing, but the size of the units having gone down across major metros, save for two, is a result of developers by and large focusing on affordable housing. Yes, indeed. That's exactly what uh, is the conclusion out of uh, this graph that you are referring to. The shrinkage of size in any case has been historically the most um, used weapon under any developer's armory. Whenever the prices would start ten, would, would uh, tend to start shooting up, the developer would typically start shrinking the sizes to make the apartment appear affordable. However, in last couple of years, uh, when uh, the new, last government gave the mantra of housing for all by 2022, under lots of those schemes like CLSS credit link, uh, uh, subsidy schemes, etc., making affordable housing was actually incentivized by government for the first time after a long, long period. So that was also one of the reasons why developers went back to their tool of shrinking the apartment sizes to make it appear more affordable. So you are absolutely right. Shrinking of the size is definitely a reason why the housing prices are looking affordable right now. Okay. And while the units would have come off right now, I was looking at this other chart that you guys or the data that you've put out, which speaks about how... Uh, in, in a lot of key markets like Mumbai, NCR, Hyderabad, etc., the affordability, uh, the house price to income ratio, uh, maybe changed a little bit, but not, not too dramatically. At, at least in the case of Mumbai, it has come down dramatically. If you look at the, the chart itself that, we are, uh, that you're referring to, Mumbai, about four to five years back, was actually upwards of 11 on that, on that uh, uh, index, which has come down to seven. Like four and a half is actually the benchmark, where above four and a half, we believe, is unaffordable, and below four and a half, it is affordable. Mumbai was at 11, which is absolutely crazy. And that number in last three to four years has come down to seven, which is, while still on the uh, slightly unaffordable side, but still very close to four and a half. The other cities, comparison to Mumbai, most of the other cities were even earlier close to six, which are not too far away from affordability, and have now come to five. But a few of these cities have actually gone way below the affordability limit. Whether you talk about Pune or Ahmedabad and even Kolkata, there the, the, the current ratings, our current indices are standing at three, which is way below affordability. That simply means that these are the cities which have huge affordable housing stock available. So just to, uh, just to add to what you were saying earlier, Mumbai has seen a dramatic fall from 11 to 7. That means Mumbai, which is always known as the most unaffordable city, at last is seemingly affordable for majority of its users. Okay. Uh, however, uh, with the house price to income ratio for certain cities like Mumbai, as you said, improved and the size of the units coming down as well, it's not resulted in big sales numbers, right? Selectively within pockets, select developers doing well. At large, you still see the real estate community, even in the Mumbai region, being under stress. 
You're absolutely right. The the sale volumes are still under duress. Uh, ever since 2011, we have continuously seen the the volume sliding down. Till last year, it had come down by almost about 38 percent compared to where the 2011 numbers were. Um, while last financial year, last year we saw a small improvement in the numbers, but to me that is still too early to predict that we have uh, we are back on the recovery path and that everything is going to be falling in place now. You are still you are right. We still don't have strong <coughs> strong signals from market to substantiate that the, the volumes are back on track. So you're right, in spite of whatever is happening, the buyer is not yet budging, is not yet willing to sign the dotted line and come back in horse to start buying apartment the way they used to do in 2011. So perhaps you may have to watch, you have to really wait for much longer than what we anticipated. So even current year is not giving any much respite to the developers from the, from the side of sales improvement. Mm. Gulam, it might be difficult to mention names out here, but wondering, have you guys done any kind of study about uh, what markets would see developers who are in need of funds not necessarily getting those funds and therefore coming under problem? Because the common belief is that there are a bunch of developers needing a lot of immediate funding, maybe at higher rates over the course of the next six to 12 months since the main source of funding, which was the NBFC space, is, is looking like drying up quite strongly or has dried up quite strongly. Which is a fact, NBFC crisis is not yet blown over. We still are seeing things, the, the, the cracks are still appearing. So uh, we want to believe that uh, funding situation for developers is very, very tough. And the way we look at it, the most sacrosanct, the most sacred kind of funding for the developer is ultimately a buyer's money coming into the business, which is still elusive, which is still uh, not happening. Right. So in the interim, the stress levels are only increasing. Now your question is, who are the ones? Well, it will be tough to really name a few of them, but uh, it's evident that majority, many of them actually are waiting in the wings to really declare themselves as on the other side of the business. Yeah, sorry, that was going to be my question. I, I mentioned that you will not be able to give names, but would you reckon that we have reached a time period where in the next six to 12 months, we might see builders folding up shop? Well, um, uh, it has happened in past as well. While uh, it's not really, you know, uh, going out there and announcing that they're folding shops, but many of them have found suitors, bigger developers with deeper pockets to rescue them from the difficult positions that they were in. So it has been happening in last two years for sure. Now, going forward, your question is, would we really see people going belly up? Like the way we perhaps saw in NCR region when quite a few of them actually landed up in NCLT and uh, lots of those tribunals. Well, it may take some time before Mumbai reaches that situation, but if the, con the situation continues the way it is today, well, even that is not too far off. Actually, somebody who goes to NCLT quite regularly tells me that amongst the main, the biggest sector, one of the two biggest sectors is real estate, a number of cases out there for projects or otherwise. But Gulab, uh, thank you so much for joining in for this quick interaction. Appreciate your time and giving us that context about what's happening to sizes and prices both. Thank you. Well, that's the view from Knight Frank. Um, and this is interesting, though it's not happening in Mumbai as of now, Devina, but we could well see some developers out here too if the stress continue ahead to NCLT. Uh, a lot of other uh, developers have already started doing that. But I tell you what, uh, it's not, while it's not best times for the developers, it's not great times for the markets as well. We started off lower, we're staying lower. The FNO show will take up all of that action on the other side from Devina and me, the team that put this show together. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you.